Okay, if I could uh, call to you uh, to attention, my name is Wayne McKay, the president of Mount Allison, and it's uh, my great honor to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Beatty and uh, his presentation today. And as so often is the case, he's literally a person who doesn't really need introduction, but uh, deserves it, so I will do it. Uh, as you all know, he, the presentation is a life given for others. A Nova Scotia boy, Sergeant Alvin E. Carter, killed in World War I. And I'm told and uh, heard, actually, in part, although I think it was a different story, that uh, this is part of a thing that uh, David uh, Beatty uh, does regularly and with great skill, as he does everything. And I thought I'd just make a couple of personal observations before I give a brief, more appropriate uh, introduction. Uh, Dr. Beatty can in some ways be blamed or credited, depending on your view, for my being here today in many respects. Uh, he was my thesis advisor and uh, professor when I went to Mount A from 67 to 70 and advised me quite wisely uh, at that stage to go to law and uh, perhaps it wasn't the best thing to pursue a PhD in history right at that point and I followed that with some degree of success. I don't think either of us actually predicted uh, that I'd be president of Mount Allison but here we are. And uh, David Beatty is also a, a personal friend as well as a mentor and inspiration, so it's a great privilege to introduce him. The other comment I'd make off a personal nature just before I do the more scripted part is that I think there's many reasons why Dr. Beatty has been so popular and successful both on and off campus, and I'm delighted to see a, a number of people from off as well as on campus here, but when I was at his retirement dinner and a number of people were doing testimonials, many of them lawyers, uh, some of them not, uh, the thing that struck me, and he performed uh, brilliantly as he always does, it struck me that the real key to uh, his success in history is he makes it human and personal. And he makes it something we can all identify with, and I'm sure that's exactly what he's going to do today as well. The more formal side. Dr. Beatty joined the history faculty at Mount Allison in 1966. I came in 67, so he's only been here one year before I was, although I left for a while. He received his Ph.D. in History and International Relations from Michigan State University in 1969, taught courses in the United States and Canadian Foreign Relations, and taught courses a bit of an understatement, of course, uh, uh, there were always lineups to get into his classes from beginning to end. Mount Allison awarded him the uh, Tucker Award for Excellence in Teaching in 1989. He's the author of uh, two books, The Vimy Pilgrimage, uh, and The Forgotten War, as well as numerous articles. And when I was reading through his impressive CV in preparation for this, I also noted a lot of uh, community work, uh, including home and school associations and others, as well as a fair bit of work with the media. And in fact, I can't remember exactly how many days ago, but I remember waking up to uh, CBC uh, in the morning and hearing that he was on a tour talking about another uh, love affair, war and love affairs, and their connections uh, seem to be uh, an important connection here anyway in St. John, I think it was in that point, so not only does he perform well here, but he takes it on the road as well. He served as Director of American Studies at Mount Allison from 1993 to 98 and co-director of the International Relations Program from 1976 to 1998. And in May of 2000, he was appointed, quite appropriately, Professor Emeritus. So it's with great pleasure that I turn it over to my friend and mentor, Dr. David Beatty. Thank you very much, President McKay. He was always a pleasure to have in class, I can tell you that. I felt honored to have had him as an honors thesis student, and we've had a warm association all these years, and I am not surprised to see that he's in the station that he's in today as president of good old Mount Allison. Before I begin, I'd like to call your attention to some very special guests that are here today from the Carter family. Mrs. Helen Carter, the sister-in-law to the soldier whose story we're going to be tracing today from Point Dubuque. And her daughter-in-law, Mrs. Kay Carter, niece 
to the soldier, grandniece to the soldier. And Earl and Kay's daughter, Jill Murray, and their son, Nathan, Chantel, Jennifer, and Rebecca. Would you folks be kind enough to stand so that you can be recognized? <laughs> and your grandmother tells me, Nathan and Chantel, that you're interested in history. Well, I want you to know that your great uncle, Alva Carter, helped to make history. And we're going to talk about him today. There are, is, there are two other people in the, and I don't, I don't see them, but Bonnie Barrow and James St. Peter. Would you be kind enough to stand and be recognized? Thank you. Gnarled old crabapple trees, cone-covered cypresses, and stately linden trees dignify the new British cemetery which stands on the western slope of Passchendaele Ridge and commands wide views of what were 80 some years ago shell plowed World War I battlefields. If one threads a path through the maze of white gravestones in plot two, row B, grave 16, one will find a stone which reads Sergeant A. E. Carter, MM, Military Medal, 85th Battalion, Canadian Infantry, 30th October 1917, the date of his death, age 21, faithful to God, King, and country. A solitary red rambler rose stands a lonely watch by the stone. The verdant grass, although it blankets the ground round about, seems reluctant to grow over the grave. Passchendaele, a village in the province of West Flanders, is located between the towns of Ypres and Roulet in Belgium. The new British cemetery lies a half mile northwest of the village on the north side of the road which runs from St. Julian to Westbrook. It covers an area of 8,066 square yards. A low rubble wall encloses it on three sides. A stone wall and entrance buildings run along the side next to the road. And the register records the particulars of 2,091 graves, 1,081 from the United Kingdom, 647 from Canada, 292 from Australia, 126 from New Zealand, four from the Royal Guernsey Infantry, three from South Africa, and one from the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. Almost all were killed in the autumn of 1917. The unnamed graves number 1,601, or more than three quarters of the whole. They, like the unknown soldier that we buried in Ottawa a year or so ago, their names are known only to God. They chose the site for the new British cemetery after the armistice because of the concentration of graves from the battlefields of Passchendaele and Landmark. At Crest Farm on the western outskirts of Passchendaele, there's a memorial to the sacrifices of Canadian forces in this area. The sacrifices of Canadians and other Allied troops at Passchendaele have well nigh been forgotten. Most names of those interred in the new British cemetery have faded from memory. At least two Canadians, though, in 1984, still remembered, 1984, still remembered Sergeant A.E. Carter, however. He was Alva Eldon Carter of River Hibbert, Nova Scotia an older brother of Lovett Carter of Point Dubuque, New Brunswick, and country and western singer Wilf Carter of Calgary in Florida. 
Lovett was a little tyke of five years, and Wilf was nearly 12 on the 6th of October in 1915, when Alva went down to Truro and enlisted in the 193rd Nova Scotia Highland Infantry Battalion. He marched off to Aldershot for basic training in Nova Scotia. At the time, their father, the Reverend W.H. Carter, served as Baptist minister in River Hibbert. A lot of Alva's pals joined him at Aldershot, Bob Hatherley of River Hibbert. William Porter of Joggins, Lyle Pugsley of Barons Field, Nova Scotia, Leo H. St. Peter of Macan, the father of Bonnie, who just stood here, Bonnie's girl, and Courtney Lesby of Amherst, Nova Scotia. This would be, for those of you who know Amherst, uh, Harold Lesby's father. They sailed overseas from Halifax on the Olympic on the 13th of October in 1916, and I have a picture of the Olympic. Some 5,000 officers and men crowded into the ship for the four and a half to five day trip. Other officers on board included Colonel J. Leighton Ralston of Amherst, who later served as Minister of National Defense from 1926 to 30 and 1940 to 44, and his brother Ivan Ralston. Fear of the unseen enemy stalking beneath the surface haunted the voyages every moment. The enemy U-boat or submarine, which would send them to a watery grave. They traveled in convoy. Well, I have some pictures of convoy, of a convoy. Escort ships accompanied the troop carrier across to Liverpool, England. They trained for a few weeks at Camp Whiteley in Surrey, England. Sergeant Carter's thoughts, while fixed on the weighty task ahead, drifted back to the cheerful hearthside in River Hibbert. He looked forward to the rapturous prospect of returning home once peace had been achieved. Before departing for the Western Front, he mailed his mother a lovely card which read as follows. He's in France now. To my truest of pals, my mother, t'was some time since I left my loved home to answer old England's cry. The parting was hard, though she tried to be brave, there was a tear in my dear mother's eye. God bless you, she said. God bless her, say I, for of mothers no man had a better. And while I'm in England, or when I go to the front, she knows that I shall never forget her. So cheer up, dear mother, my truest of pals, though the parting at parting your heart may feel sore. We will look forward with hearts full of hope and true happiness when peace comes once more, ever thinking of you, Alva. He underlined the words, for of mothers no man had a better. He sent a similar card to his father, addressing it to, quote, my best chum, my father. Fortunately, Alva sent home a picture taken of him before embarking for France, and it shows him seated in a chair with he head held high, Thanks to that photo, I had something to remember my big brother by, Lovett Carter observed in an interview in 1984 while pumping gas at his service station, internationally known service station and truck stop in Point Dubuque, New Brunswick. The portrait still hung in the parlor of Lovett's home in 1984. Lovett, for those of you who don't know, was Helen Carter's husband. Lovett explained also that until the mid-1980s, the Carter family had a living reminder of Alva. Alva had a boyhood friend and later sweetheart, Miss Maud Greenfield of River Hibbert. Lover noted, Lovett noted that one of the saddest and most tragic aspects of this war was the blight which had cast upon the lives of those who waited at home. Maud, like thousands of other Canadians at the time, did a lot of watching and dreading as news drifted in of the slaughter on the Western Front. Maud carried a touch for Alva, sorry, a torch for Alva all her life. Although she married, she used to drive over to Point Dubuque to visit us, Lovett recalled. She continued to do that until her death. Alva mailed Maud a parting note before leaving Camp Whiteley in England to go to the front, to go across the channel to France. And it read, Though afar from you I wander, 
Time and distance made the stronger links of friendship's chain. So I send this loving greeting. May God have you in his keeping till we meet again. They never were to meet again. Private Lyle Pugsley, Alva's boyhood friend, and for those of you, some of you will remember Paul Pugsley, who attended here and was a student of mine, and some of the other faculty members here. Paul Pugsley, his great-grandfather was Lyle Pugsley of Barons Field, Nova Scotia, near, Am near Amherst. Private Lyle Pugsley, Alva's boyhood friend, recalled in a 1984 interview that on the 6th of December in 1916, he said, we marched down the long ramp along Folkestone Seafront, that would be England's seafront, and boarded small ships to cross the channel, the English Channel, crossing to La Havre, France. About 600 of us huddled into the hold of that little ship for a rough, miserable crossing. You could hear the waves smashing against the hull and over the deck. We moved into trenches in a sector between Lens and Arras, we joined the famed 85th Battalion Nova Scotia Highlanders. Directly in front of us lay Vimy Ridge. Alva Carter spent his last Christmas in that trench. Thoughts of home weighed heavily on everyone's mind that Christmas day. Alva mailed home a Christmas card from the front which read, at Christmas time from one of the Nova Scotia Highlanders. And we can't get back for a little while yet as we're stopping to finish this job. A Christmas greeting sent with all good wishes, kind thoughts, and sincerest remember remembrances from your loving son Alva in the field, 1916. Sergeant Carter fought in the Battle of Vimy Ridge, April 9 through 12, 1917, the greatest Canadian victory of the war. That marked the first time that all four divisions of the Canadian Corps had attacked together. In mid-August 1917, Alva participated in the battle which ended in victory at Hill 70 outside the dirty French coal mining city full of slag heaps and dirt, the French city of Lens. Of the many appalling battles of World War I, none proved grimmer than the Third Battle of Ypres, whose crowning episodes were the Passchendaele engagements of October and November of 1917. Commander-in-Chief British Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig, against the advice of his army commanders, was determined to obtain Passchendaele Ridge for his winter 1917-1917 line. Winston Churchill and other British cabinet ministers considered his plan senseless and justifiably feared that it would result in a horrifying massacre. They thought it was far wiser to consolidate Allied forces on the defensive behind Passchendaele Swamp, and I have pictures of that swamp, and await the buildup of American troops in 1918. The U.S. had entered the war in April of 1917, but had proved unable to amass their forces in significant numbers on the Western Front, and they won't until the summer of 1918. Sadly, the politicians uncourageously avoided risking a showdown on the question with the headstrong commander-in-chief, Haig. Worse still, they did not replace him. They believed it politically dangerous to challenge Haig. The British electorate might construe such confrontation with the commander as unpatriotic, and so despite their deep misgivings, they handed Haig the reins. In the first four weeks following the opening assault, on July 31st, 1917, now listen to this, in the first four weeks, starting on July 31, the British lost 68,000 men. In an average advance, 68,000, in an average advance of less than two miles along a few thousand yards of front. Finally, on October 5th, after continued carnage and failure, even to reach objectives planned for the first day's attack, Haig decided to employ the Canadian Corps at Passchendaele. He placed Canadians under command, the Canadians under the command of General Sir H. C. O. Plummer, commander of the British Second Army. Plummer ordered General Arthur Curry, this was the commander of the, Arthur Curry, commander of the Canadian Corps, formerly a real estate dealer before he, before he uh, 
I got into the armed forces. Plummer ordered General Sir Arthur Curry, commander of the Canadian Corps, to submit plans for Passchendaele's capture. Curry would have preferred to have avoided Passchendaele. Nevertheless, on October 18th, he ventured forward to survey the battlefield. This area of Flanders consisted of land reclaimed from the sea, similar to the marshlands between Amherst and Sackville. Ditches drained it and dikes kept it above water. The artillery bombardment had destroyed the dikes and returned the territory to bog, bogland. Much of the land in front of Passchendaele village lay under water or consisted of deep mire. Frequently, infantrymen had to wade waist deep in mud with guns held over their heads while under blistering fire. Supporting artillery fire was slow and inaccurate. After firing around the big guns, the, the heavy artillery would settle into the slime and require re-aiming. On the other hand, the enemy had prepared for the attack in superb fashion. Out across the swamp, they had constructed an elaborate network of cement bunkers. The enemy manned these bunkers with machine gunners, and beyond the swamp on the high ground lay a formidable array, about two miles across the swamp, a formidable array of German field and heavy artillery. I might add that, that the uh, Allies dubbed these, these bunkers, these cement bunkers, pillboxes. Curry confided to his diary that, and I quote, the battlefield looks bad. No salvaging has been done, and very few dead buried. Bloated, stenchy horse and mule carcasses, rusty tanks, half-buried locomotives, and twisted bits of track. Wrecked wagons and refuse littered the, ha the landscape. Neither side had been able to gather the human remains due to the incessant shelling. The faces of the newly dead, if not swathed in mud, still looked white. Others had turned gray or green or black or had decomposed. Through the rain and the mist, Curry could discern the dim outline of Passchendaele Ridge two miles away. Death and devastation was on every side. The ghastly sight convinced Curry that the Canadian Corps should not be committed to Passchendaele. He believed the operation impossible except at tremendous cost and futile. Courageously, he expressed that opinion to both Plummer and Haig. Curry stated privately to his diary, I carried my protest to the extreme limit, which I believe would have resulted in my being sent home if I had been other than the Canadian Corps commander. I pointed out what the casualties were bound to be. He said 16,000, he estimated, and asked if success would justify the sacrifice, and I was ordered to go ahead and make the attack. Accordingly, Curry plans three separate attacks. The first commenced at 5.40 a.m., 26th of October, 1917. A flooded stream inundated a large area, flooded a large area in the middle of the battlefield, forcing Curry to split the assault in two. The 3rd Canadian Division advanced north of the flooded section, the 4th south of it. The 85th Infantry Battalion Nova Scotia Highlanders fought with the 4th Division. Soldiers crawled through mud knee-deep, sometimes waist-deep. Some slipped into the morass and drowned in the quagmire. Shortly after daylight, an icy rain slanted down, and they, that continued throughout the day. By 29 October, the Canadian Corps had managed to advance over the field of slaughter, listen to this, only some 800 yards. In four days, the Canadians suffered 2,481 casualties, about a third of them fatal. General Curry planned a second attack for October 30th. Notice it's just about this time of year, Halloween time. Recently passed. A second attack for, he planned a second attack for October 30th. Sergeant Alva Carter spent his last evening with comrades shivering under rubber ground sheets beside putrid, water filled shell holes. Typically, the enemy sent in low flying aircraft to randomly strafe and bomb the battlefield. Sorties, which inevitably inflicted casualties among the men who were obliged to bivouac in the ocean. Oh, sorry, in the open. All six Canadian battalions of the 3rd and 4th Divisions assembled, waiting for zero hour. A bright moon shone overhead. Its silvery beams illuminated the rain-drenched ground and shivered, shimmered gaulishly on water-filled craters. The night air, this late fall evening, turned frosty chilling men to the bone as they sat gazing out over 
the swamp that they would have to attempt to camp capture on the morrow. Around 2 a.m., the moon quit its watch, and the sky blackened. At 5.40 a.m., the artillery opened up with a deafening roar. Infantrymen started to their feet and struggled forward. The 85th Battalion, Nova Scotia Highlanders, led by Lieutenant Colonel A.H. Borden, advanced on the right of the front. Sergeant Alva Carter's friend, 17-year-old Lance Corporal Leo H. St. Peter of Macan, Nova Scotia, may have been the last Amherst area man to see Alva alive. In an interview just prior to his death in December of 1984, Leo reflected upon the grisly events surrounding the Canadian Corps' second blow struck at Passchendaele on the 30th of October, 1917. Leo's platoon, a part of the 85th Battalion, Nova Scotia Highlanders, had assembled a few yards from Alva's platoon. The two men had exchanged a word, had exchanged a word or two during the evening of the 29th of October. Alva had one up on Leo that night. Leo recalled that Carter had just gotten a pair of high-top boots from home. In all that mud, such footwear furnished a lively concert conversation piece among the soldiers. There was some friendly joshing about Carter's new boots. The two men pitched forward through the quaggy ooze at zero hour, 5.50 a.m., that 30th October morning, they fought within sight of one another. In that murky dawn light, the 85th Battalion, Nova Scotia Highlanders, the 78th Battalion, Winnipeg Gren Grenadiers, and the 72nd Battalion, Seaforth Highlanders of Canada, captured Vienna Cottage and Crest Farm in the initial assault. They reached all their objectives by 8.30 a.m. The enemy had ingeniously arranged their machine gun nests, camouflaging them, around farmhouses, barns, haystacks, clumps of marsh brush. As the Canadians attempted to consolidate their forces, the Germans launched a thunderous bombardment of Vienna Cottage and Crest Farm, and they kept pommeling the area with murderous fire throughout the day. One of the artillery shells struck the spot where Sergeant Alva Carter had crouched with his comrades. Leo St. Peter remembered the violent concussion of the shell's impact and the shock of the aftermath. I saw him when they dragged him out, Leo said. He still had those boots on. That was the only way you could recognize him. In a low, fervent voice, Leo paid tribute to his old comrades. He leaned forward in his chair and he said, Alva, was fearless. Nothing daunted him. Alva probably never received the last gift that Maud Greenfield sent to him. Lovett Carter recalls sadly that shortly before Passchendaele, Maud had baked a lovely cake for him and mailed it overseas. Alva likely never knew about that. My guess is that he died before it ever arrived at the front, Lovett said. Despite the ground gained at Vienna Cottage and Crest Farm, the Canadian Corps failed to reach its object, all its objectives that day. In late afternoon, General Curry ordered the assault halted so that his troops might reorganize. They had advanced the line across the swamp about a thousand yards at a frightful cost of 884 Canadian dead and 1,429 wounded, almost as many as had been lost in the previous four-day attack, 26 to 29 October 1917. General Curry delayed the third attack for a week in order to bring up fresh troops and acclimatize them to the terrain. The third and fourth divisions pulled out and the first and second Canadian divisions replaced them. On the 6th of November, the Canadians took Passchendaele Village. Still, Haig's headquarters ordered them to battle on and rest the remaining high ground north of the village on the 10th of November. That final day's push across Passchendaele Ridge cost the Canadians 1,094 men, 420 of them gave their lives. On the 15th of November, Haig belatedly called off the slaughter. The Passchendaele offensive lasted 109 days and advanced the line on the Ypres salient. This was a bulge, a bulge near the town of Ypres. A salient is a bulge into the, into the German lines. 
advanced, uh, the offensive had advanced the line then on the Ypres salient for four and a half, only four and a half miles. They had moved inland only four and a half miles against to the German lines in all this time. The costs were woeful, indeed scandalous. The forces under Haig's command, now listen to this, had lost some 300,000 men at Passchendaele. The Canadian losses in three battles, fought from the 26th of October to the 15th of November 1917, totaled 15,654 men. Curry had estimated it would take 16,000 lives. The 85th Battalion, Nova Scotia Highlanders, suffered the most severe casualties at Passchendaele of any single engagement during the war. The 85th Battalion remained in Passchendaele locally for only 36 hours after the 30th of October attack. Lieutenant Colonel Borden withdrew his men from the front and reorganized them and moved to another sector 320 miles away. They stayed there in Passchendaele just long enough for Leo St. Peter to get his arm shot off. He was 17 years old at the time. He related that fresh drinking water had to be hauled from Eep area five miles away by mule over plank roads and then up through the mud toward the front. We carried it, the soldiers had to carry it, we carried it in gas cans and it was dreadful stuff to drink. The soldiers took over carrying water and food for the rest of the way. A sniper's bullet hit Leo as he trudged to the front, he was very close to the German lines, uh, trudged to the front, loaded down with water and rations. The 85th Battalion evacuated the area a few hours later. And it, interestingly, uh, Leo gave the German sniper credit for saving his life. Uh, at first, I was a bit taken back by that, but he said that sniper was so close to him, and he, he, sh he shot him in the, in the arm, just, just below the, the socket here, winged him. He said if he'd, if he'd, he could have easily, he said he thought that he probably saw how young he was and all he wanted to do was take him out of the war and he, so he winged him and he, he hit him here in the, in, in the just, just below the, the uh, socket and it was hanging there by a few cords uh, and he managed to get back to a dressing station and the medic picked up a knife and he cut the, cut the cords off and threw his uh, arm in a can and Leo said, I, I almost felt like laughing. He said, I was in such a shade of, of, of shock. And then finally it hit me about an hour later and he said, I almost died. But uh, he said then he faced the proposition of having to, he had lied his age, he joined up at 17. He had the problem of going back to work, going back after having been discharged with one arm competing for jobs with young, healthy guys with 18, 19 year olds, 17 year olds that had two arms. They eventually buried Sergeant Carter almost on the spot where he fell. A small rough hewn wooden cross with a metal name tag marked the grave. The Passchendaele swamp lay dotted with hundreds of these crosses. Weathering soon bleached them to an ashy colored gray. Shell bursts, bursts disinterred many of the bodies. Some of the dead remained unburied, frozen in the gumbo muck all winter. In the spring, the frost heaved the, heaved the corpses out of the half-melted sludge, and only then could they be gathered and given a proper burial. Many grave sites were lost, only to be discovered months, sometimes years later after the war, or not discovered at all. Alva Carter, Carter's was one of them one of those that was discovered long after the war. Many were simply never found. Most analysts today, historians, agree, as they did in 1917, that the Passchendaele Swamp and Ridge in no way constituted vital ground, that the axis of the advance had veered toward the Channel Coast away from German communications so that it provided little base for eroding enemy strength. Even more disheartening, Haig's Passchendaele Offensive failed to endanger Germany's formidably entrenched position in France. General Curry commented later that Passchendaele seemed to symbolize to Haig all of the difficulties of 1917 
and he chose for its capture the only corps in France capable of doing it. That's why the Canadians, he said, went to Passchendaele. On the 67th anniversary of Alva Carter's death in October of 1984, Lovett Carter reminisced about his boyhood memories of the war. He said, I was too young to remember much about the war. Wilf, I think, recalls a lot more than I. But two events stand out in my recollections of 1918. The Baptist parsonage burned, forcing our family to move to Greenwich, Nova Scotia, and the Army sent home some of Alva's personal belongings, some grim wartime souvenirs. My father, who ministered to the Baptist charge in Point de Butte from December of 1919 until his death in 1928, kept these uh, mementos in, uh, kept them, and when my mother passed away in 1953, the articles got handed down to me, the youngest, uh, in a family of six boys and three girls. For a boy at the impressionable age of seven, just a little old, uh, younger than you, Nathan, for a boy at the impressionable age of seven, no item fascinated me more than Alva's bayonet, which the Army returned in the condition in which they had found it on the battlefield. It was enclosed in a scabbard, and when my father pulled it out of the scabbard, you could still see dried blood encrusted up along the hill. The first thing that struck me about it was that it was long enough to run two men through at one jab. Alva also picked up a pointed top German helmet with the words, with God for king and fatherland, emblazed across the crest. The army returned a Canadian helmet too with a, with a bullet or shrapnel crease deep down the center of it. We didn't like to speculate on whose that was. There was a long cylinder shaped rifle grenade in a bronze artillery shell casing. The latter, Lovett, in 1984, still put to good use as a doorstop. The army returned two items which Lovett treasured above all else. Alva's silver-headed swag stick and his billfold. The swagger stick hung beneath Sergeant Carter's portrait in the parlor. The billfold contained a mini miniature 1917 calendar. Alva had circled the dates of the major battles in which he fought. The identification card was still there. My name is A.E. Carter of River Hibbert, Cumberland County, Nova Scotia. Alva's sailing card on the ship Olympic dated 13 October 1916, remained tucked away inside as well. Sergeant Carter was awarded the Military Medal for courage and gallantry in the field. Like so many other Canadian families who lost, lost loved ones overseas in World War I, the Carters had to endure the additional pain of knowing that Alva's grave had been lost. Lieutenant Colonel J.L. Ralston, who took over command of the 85th Battalion, Nova Scotia Highlanders in 1919, wrote a letter to Rose Carter, Alva's mother, from Belgium, on the 21st of April, 1919. So here's a letter from the commander of the 85th to Alva's mother, Rose Carter, and Lovitz and Wilf's mother. From Belgium, April, 1919. Ralston confessed that what it was that, and I quote him, it has been, he said, a melancholy satisfaction for us to be able to erect near the village of Passchendaele a memorial to our comrades who gave their lives here. And uh, Alva's name is on, inscribed on this uh, memorial. He sent, Ralston sent Rose Carter a photograph of the monument with the names of the fallen inscribed upon it. In December of 1919, Reverend Carter's family moved to Point de Butte, New Brunswick. Sixteen months later, sixteen months, a letter dated 30th of April, 1921, appeared unexpectedly in the mail addressed to Mrs. Rose Carter from the Canadian militia. The message came as a bit of a shock to the family. It caught them unprepared. They had put the matter of Alva's grave behind them. The message read as follows. During the work of searching the late battle areas for undisclosed, unlocated graves, the officers of the graves registration units have been successful in locating the isolated grave of Sergeant Carter, and the remains have been removed and reburied in a military cemetery in order that the grave could be properly cared for. The removal was carried out with every measure of care and reverence, special arrangements having been made for an appropriate religious service, 
and attached here too is a report which contains all the available information relative to the new grave. The letter included a photo of the weather blackened wood cross, wooden cross which marked Sergeant Carter's desolate grave on Passchendaele Swamp. While looking back on things past in 1984, Lovett Carter commented to me, he said, Wilf and I are the only ones left now out of a family of nine children. Although Wilf lives in Florida and I in New Brunswick, we've always remained close and periodically we get on the phone and call one another up for a long talk. Remembrance Day 1984 proved to be a special one for them. Wilf spent the 11th of November weekend in Point de Butte with the family after an absence of almost a decade. He saw Lovett and Lovett's wife Helen, whom you've just met, and their son Earl, Kay's husband, Kay Carter's husband, and his family, whom you've just met. On that October 11th, uh, I might add here that uh, he was, uh, Wilf was on a kind of farewell tour. 80th birthday, actually he'll come back when he's 85 and do it again, but uh, an 80th birthday tour and had a concert, a big concert in, in Moncton this week on this particular weekend. On that November 11th weekend, they had a bountiful supper at the farmhouse where Earl and Kay and their family live and Helen lives nearby. For Lovett, who was then 73 years old, and Wilf, who was almost 80, the family and the family, it was a heart-swelling reunion. I had the good luck to see some of that reunion because Earl Carter called me, Earl being Lovett's son, called me at work here at Mount A, and he said, Wilf, we'll be here for supper tonight around 7. Would you like to join us for the evening? Well, I guess I said, would I? I would not have missed that evening for the world. Lovett passed away in 1988 at age 77, and Wilf in 1996 at age 91. Lovett recalled that their mother, their mother kept two keepsakes hidden away in the family Bible, which helped to keep memories pictures of Alva vivid until her death. They consisted of a scroll and a poem and summoned up memory of a son and a brother. They betoken how Lovett, they suggest how Lovett and Wilf wanted Alva remembered on that, the 70th anniversary of the outbreak of the Great War, the outbreak of World War I. The scroll reads as follows, George V. He whom this scroll commemorates was numbered among those who at the call of king and country left all that was dear to them, endured hardness, faced danger, and finally passed out of sight of men by the path of duty and sacrifice, giving up their lives that others might live in freedom. Let those who come after see to it that his name, Alva's name, be not forgotten. Sergeant Alva Eldon Carter, MM, Military Medal, Canadian Infantry. And the poem, Victory, by St. John native J. Harold Manning, from a collection of his poems, Corsola, and other poems published after his death, Manning's death in 1924. Sleep ye in peace on Flanders plain. Your righteous cause, though tears and pain, through tears and pain have triumphed, for the nations all have shaken off the tyrant's thrall. And now supreme doth freedom reign. 
For those crimson flowers a stain of fresher crimson spreads amain. And awakened peoples heard the call from Flanders fields. Fear not, ye have not died in vain. Your flickering torch burns high again. A million hands, whate'er befall, are pledged to guard it lest it fall. In memory proud that ye lie slain on Flanders field. This is, this is a little love it, Carter. Dressed in his brother's uniform, or a version of it, the belt buckle and the gun, taken at River Hibbert, in front of the church. Perhaps five or six years old there, the age of some of your children, Bill. I'm indebted to I'm indebted to Wade Settle for the assistance on this. That's the picture that's in the parlor. That's Alva Carter, and there's the swagger stick. Head held high. That's Lovett Carter, his, his brother, from Point of Butte, Helen's husband. Wilf, Wilf Carter. And that's just the way he looked the night I met him, with his silver buckle and his western boots and his just a bundle of energy, almost 80 years old. Alva, that, anybody guess where that's taken? That's, that's the courthouse in Amherst, in front of the courthouse. Alva Carter is, a, is in the front to the extreme right. And Jay Layton Ralston is in the center, back, back, well, right in the center of the picture. Later becomes Minister of National Defense. This would have been from the 100, and the, the 85th was not a kilted battalion. This would have been the training battalion, the 193rd that they joined. That's, for those of you who know Amherst at all, that's Cyril Ratchford, the man on the right. Uh, lived to be way up in his 90s, worked for, uh, was in the banking business. Uh, the fellow on the left's from Truro, and he had a clothing store there. Two guys from the 85th. Trying to get this thing to go. Help me forward that. What am I doing? Okay. Which one's in the past there? That's, uh, let's see, Victoria Street in Amherst, Royal Bank here. Uh, Sarah Ratchford gave me this picture. That's the 22nd, the Royal 22nd with Vanier, their route marching through, uh, through Amherst. Uh, Vanier, of course, will lose a leg eventually in, in uh, the Western Front. But they, were, they stayed in Amherst a couple of weeks before heading to the ships to go overseas. I think this was in 1915. Well, that's not very clear, but that's Leo H. St. Peter, whom we heard from in the... Uh, in the, in the uh, story, if you like, is the uh, father of uh, Bonnie Cyril here. Uh, Lighty's age, joined up at age 17, as we said. Anybody recognize where that's taken? That's the silver, the 85th Battalion uh, Silver Band, and uh, you can't be blamed for not guessing. You're being, that's the Amherst Hotel up there on the right. 
They're waiting at the railway station. That's the Olympic, loaded with some 5,000 men, 5,500 officers, or officers and men. Uh, it's a sister ship, it was, to the Titanic. And in, and in a number of cases, I'm told uh, that uh, newspapers used the picture of the Olympic uh, and called it the, tit uh, uh, the Titanic. Uh, but they were, very, they were big four stackers. I, I said I had some pictures of a convoy. There's, there's a convoy you can see up there at the top. See the steamships uh, in, the, in the background, the steam curling up. This one down here is not as, well, is not very clear, but uh, water, water everywhere, as uh, far as they could see. Uh, recreation time, and they were packed into these troop ships like sardines. They were uh, hardly a place to crawl, uh, never mind a place for calisthenics. Uh, Camp Whiteley in England, where, uh, where Alva trained for a brief period of time. Uh, Bombardment of a French village once he's over, sea, uh, over across the channel. If that were a little clearer, you'd see there's literally a sea of barbed wire between where we are here in the front and uh, in the rear of the, or the back of the picture. There's a better of a close up. How would you like to crawl through that with machine guns uh, tearing you apart? Uh, that guy's probably uh, looking for, looks like he might be looking for a mine. Uh, to uh, I don't know what we, oh, that, that's, uh, that's too dark. Uh, from, from my perspective, it's not very clear. That's, that's the one shot I had here, the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Wait, I'm having trouble getting that thing to... You can see the. Okay, now I've got a few here of pa uh, shots of Passchendaele. You can ju you can see, well, they, the pictures tell the story. There's the mules they use to bring the water up often, or shells up. Uh, in this case, you can look at the slop and the mud. Uh, imagine trying to exist in that. Terrible conditions. Huge craters. If you fell into them, uh, you were you you were uh, in serious trouble. Carrying the the wounded, trying to avoid falling into the shell holes. These are these are all from Passchendaele. Another one carrying out the wounded. Just utter devastation. That's what Curry saw, you see. Two miles of it across to the to Vimy Ridge. Or sorry, to, to Passchendaele Ridge, I beg your pardon. Close up of some of the shell holes, filled with water, flooded. They tell their own story. How anybody could have survived? is almost beyond belief, especially, well, any time, but especially in the fall or, the, or winter. I think there's, a, there's the ruins of a tank out there in the middle of that, sort of thing that Curry described in his diary. That's the Landover Castle. Uh, when Leo, that's a Red Cross ship, uh, Leo, St. Peter went home on, the, on this, this, uh, this was a, they, a complete hospital. They had equipment there. There were 60-some nurses on there, a full house complement of hospital staff. It was a floating hospital. Uh, on its return voyage, Leo got off and they let he, he got off in Halifax uh, with his one arm gone. And uh, this ship on its return trip was torpedoed. And uh, all of the... All but one lifeboat uh, was lost. Uh, one of them overturned with, a, I don't know, 30-some uh, nurses in it, and they were all lost. Uh, 
only only one lifeboat was was saved. Uh, if anybody's looking for a for a good MA thesis, here's a here's a good topic because uh, the the Ger the Allies contended that the Germans stayed on the on the scene and machine gunned the lifeboats to destroy the evidence. Uh, I've done a little research on it myself. Uh, the, the Germans, on the other hand, contended that the medical personnel so-called on there were really military personnel and that the uh, hold of that ship was full of munitions. Uh, I say there was a good, somebody's looking for an honors thesis. Where's the truth? That's Carter's grave, to wind this up, uh, that I described there in the New British Cemetery, Sergeant L.B. Carter. The Olympic again, although he wasn't on it when it came home after the war. A shot of the New British Cemetery where he's buried. A memorial service, anybody recognize where that's taken? Not very far away, Mount Watley. And they're dedicating there. I'm not sure, uh, Lovett Carter gave me that slide, or gave me that picture or slide, uh, probably 1919. They're dedicating the monument there. And of course, Vimy Ridge, the Vimy Memorial, near Passchendaele, not too far from Passchendaele, the Vimy Memorial. That's the end of the, of the story. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.